Okay, hands up. Who's, who, uh, who wants to listen about the GraphQL? <laughs> That's good because you are in a wrong session. <laughs> because, I'm gonna listen yeah, because cause we switched, so Amit will be talking about uh, tomorrow at 2.25 on the main stage about the GraphQL. And I will be talking about the uh, microservices and uh, API management and their relations. So you have one minute to leave if you're not interested on, on, on this topic. Good, so, so you, you eat all you can. Okay, so let, let's uh, uh, go and start. So uh, the big driver uh, as for all the kind of a modernization or transformation in the uh, IT industries is driven by a digitalization, so buzzword, but that's kind of a reality. So, so this is why companies are actually doing some kind of a transformation. So, so to digitalize and then drive business through that. Uh, what it means in the uh, uh, IT landscape is that uh, the modernization of the architecture does not only touch uh, software. So, so even though the transformation is typically driven by the uh, infrastructure and technology changes, it affects uh, then through the technology, the architecture that can be deployed into your uh, environment. And that allows you to have more flexibility on the architecture, and that drives the change in the processes and how people are actually uh, using the software or deploying the software, how it's developed, and how you are teaming up around the development of these assets. So these are the uh, big drivers uh, around the, the modernization, which includes modernization of the uh, integration, modernization of the application landscape, modernization of the infrastructure, cloud, and so on. So there's a lot of moving parts. But the, the kind of a, what you are trying to gain from this uh, modernization of, of the applications is, is uh, uh, typically the kind of a deployment agility is the first one. Uh, and that, that's uh, driven by the, the more fine-grained deployment of the, of the uh, components in your architecture. This means that you are actually splitting uh, bigger pieces into smaller chunks that are easier to manage. Uh, taking one monolithic application, uh, splitting that into a more smaller pieces allows you to uh, version uh, those components independently. It allows you to scale individual uh, components. It allows you to change one component without affecting the, the uh, other components in the application. So uh, loosely coupled services uh, consisting uh, or making up the bigger uh, uh, applications or, or uh, bigger holes, as, a, uh, as to say. That drives the shorter uh, deployment cycles or times. When you have a smaller piece of, of code that you, know, you want to develop and deploy, uh, the cycles come uh, shorter and then they are kind of independent. You don't need to pay attention for the microservice next uh, to you when you are deploying a new version uh, since you have uh, loosely coupled uh, independent components that you can uh, publish to the same environment. And then the whole uh, management of the of the components becomes independent. That drives the deployment agility. Uh, well, then the kind of a uh, deployment uh, of fine-grained deployment allows you to then also decentralize the ownership, which means that uh, the uh, application development teams can be kind of a, uh, constructed in the more modern, agile ways. Uh, through the uh, guilds and teams and chapters and uh, so on. So, so it doesn't need to be uh, function layers anymore. And that uh, allows you to avoid the kind of a, uh, what, what you call the, is, is kind of a priorities conflict. Uh, when you have, let's say, the old fashioned typical way you have a backend services, you have a middleware, and then you have a front end. When the front end wants a change, 
something uh, that needs data from the back end. It needs to uh, de de kind of manage the project of the change through the middleware and the back end. And the priorities might be totally different for the middleware than the front end or the back end. And then there becomes conflicts of, of the priorities, how things are done. By splitting up the same knowledge, the same people into a different, more agile groups and gaining the, the or giving uh, the independence of these teams to develop new things uh, makes the, the kind of a development more agile and then speeds up the development. And this, everything is typically backed up by a cloud native infra infrastructure. So everything runs on the containerized environments uh, where you can actually have the, the platform to give you scalability, elastic scalability of the different components and uh, built-in resilience. Those all the drop-down services can pop up automatically. The, the orchestration can decide where it's best to run those components and so on. So there's the operational uh, agility. Build once and, and deploy wherever it's best to run. So when it comes to the uh, microservices, uh, if you're not familiar, I'm not going to go through the Google 12-factor uh, application, so that's kind of a defines uh, what is a microservice. But there are a couple of uh, characteristics of, of the services that make up the, the microservice. It doesn't uh, necessarily uh, tell you anything about the size of the actual service. So uh, I, I've heard the uh, term uh, micro-component architecture, which actually I think describes it more better. So you split up a, a application into a smaller components rather than services. So the component doesn't necessarily actually <coughs> publish a, a service. So, so uh, but, but the idea is that they are self-contained, uh, loosely coupled uh, components that uh, are kind of isolated uh, from the dependencies. Uh, that's why in the microservices architecture, the reuse is actually typically done through copy rather than you have a multiple calls inside a sim single uh, uh, service. And then uh, you have a kind of a the environment you you uh, kind of also try to isolate the backing services uh, as a, as a um, kind of a attached resources. So if you need something, you try to attach those things into a microservice. And uh, you try to have the configuration inside the component so it's, you can transfer that between the environments. And then uh, the build time and run times are, are totally separated. So you build somewhere and then you, you can actually push that thing around your, your environment. So that's a short description of, of microservices. Then when you start building up your microservices, you, you, your environment starts to look uh, quite, a, quite a messy or, or a complicated, let's say. You have a lot of different uh, microservices and managing those and the whole in, uh, environment becomes uh, harder when, when uh, you have independent uh, small components. So, so uh, that's why it's important to define boundaries uh, that make up your, your application. So you need to define what is an application boundary, which are the components that make up the application. And um, there are a lot of tools, uh, for example, Kubernetes, uh, provides you namespaces where, the, where you run those components within a namespace that then you know, isolates those into a single uh, block of, of uh, services and makes up the boundary of, of the application. And they, that makes it more manageable and uh, allows you to uh, kind of a, uh, have, for example, an ownership of the application similar to the siloed uh, monolithic application. But then uh, when you start uh, providing services outside of your application boundary, how do you actually do that? And you know, of course we are in the API management uh, event, so it's through APIs. Uh, 
and the uh, boundaries and the services exposed to outside of the application are enforced by API gateways. So there could be different uh, uh, services within the applications that are not generally available, so those are not exposed outside of the application. But when you start uh, reusing or, or making the kind of a network of the applications, you utilize APIs, and APIs are enforced through the gateways. So that kind of a, is the, the first connection between microservices and, and the uh, APIs. The API management is, is uh, much more than, than just a gateway. So uh, APIs, uh, the gate, what, what the gateway does is it actually enforces the calls to the uh, inside of the, the uh, microservices applications or the API implementation. Uh, that should not be burdened, uh, the microservices should not care about who's using them and uh, how they are called or who's, who's calling and how much and so on. So that should be uh, put to the gateway level. But the gateway level is, the gateway itself is, is fairly technical component. Uh, so, so what it do, does, it, it actually uh, enforces the, the uh, uh, policies that could be traffic management security. It can do different kind of a translation, uh, protocol transformation. Uh, it decouples the, the services and hides the complexity of the actual implementation. But, uh, but the actual API management capability should be more customer driven. So, so it's not the technical. API management is not an integration program. It's not a, a technical exercise. It should be a, a customer driven uh, business approved uh, a project. And that uh, makes it, uh, there should be at the minimum, okay, uh, is there somebody coming or should I? Well, let's not pause here because we don't have much time. So, so basically, uh, if, if you, for example, have read the uh, Gartner predictions for, for integrations for, for 2019, there was a, uh, there's two concerns around the API management project. Uh, the first one was around security. So, so they predicted that the, the almost 25% of the uh, project needs to be rolled back because of the issues of the, of the security on the API management initiatives. And the other one was the kind of a customer-centric things around the, the products. And that help for that was the, the, to have an API uh, product manager role in the environment that got, gathers the uh, information and uh, kind of a sees the overview of the APIs in the environment. And that needs also a tooling which is kind of a delivered through a API manager tooling where you can uh, manage the ways you, how you publish to who you publish, how you manage your consumer organizations, uh, with ap which applications can call your APIs and how much and so on. And then uh, onboarding of those consumers is uh, done through a, a uh, API uh, developer portal, which is kind of a marketplace for your APIs. And that provides kind of a self-sufficiency for the developers to find out information uh, about the uh, APIs that you have, allows you to register to use those, allows you to find all the documentation, test those, and uh, see how that works, and uh, register your applications uh, see the analytics uh, on your consumption of the APIs and when you're reaching, for example, rate limits, things like that. So the API management becomes then uh, much more uh, um, customer-centric and more productized. Okay, the guys are debugging here, but uh, <laughs> let me just, uh, okay. I have no, it's, it's, it doesn't work. Yeah, well, let me talk you through this uh, anyway. So uh, we just uh, uh, saw that the, the applications are built on the smaller components, microservices and so on. So then we have the capabilities of defining the boundaries of the, yeah. 
Okay. And that's IT. Uh, no. Good. No. Good job. Yeah. In Finland, we have this saying, onko kiira vai tehäkö ATKlla? So, this, this applies here. So, are we saying that then you should have a gay for per API implementation? So, so, should you split your API management into such small pieces? No, that's not what we are saying. What we are saying is that you should have a decentralized ownership on a centralized API management infrastructure. So that this allows you to actually uh, have or give the ownership of different implementations to different groups and that this could be done in the multi-tenant way so these are kind of isolated but you still have one management, one developer portal, one gateway over the infrastructure of your microservices. So you should not have multiple API managers uh, or API manager per API implementation. That makes it impossible, for example, to API product manager to manage what APIs you have your, in your organization. We're not saying there, there are cases where you might want to have multiple different uh, developer portals, for example. You might have a couple of instances of developer portals for different groups with different rules and uh, even different uh, look and feel around that. And of course there are a lot of, or, or a couple of, of uh, use cases where you want to slip, uh, split your gateways into multiple <laughs> instances. Uh, for example, uh, one use case is that you have multiple different lines of business uh, that are developing the application, so, so you might want to split the gateways, uh, so th there's a gateway per line of business, for example. But still, you want one centralized management to see, see everything on your, on your organizations and uh, I, kind of an API cloud, so, so to speak. The more kind of a typical way or uh, rising way of, of uh, or need for separating these API gateways is the kind of a multi-cloud thing that is basically happening in all the organizations. I bet in each and every one's organizations that where you're from, there are at least a couple of different uh, clouds that you have services or will have services that you want to expose. So this is the typical way. So you might have a couple of different public clouds, private cloud, on-premises, but you still want one centralized management over that. So you want to see who is using and how much of the, the APIs and services that you have in your environment. So that's the, the way that, or kind of a need that you will have in the future when you start doing your API management journey. Be prepared that you will have uh, gateways close to the backend services, but one centralized management over to govern all those APIs. Then getting back to the microservices again is that uh, as we spoke, so, so the external invocation of the services within the microservices applications is governed through the, the exposure gateway or the API gateway. So typically there's some kind of a boundary, organizational boundary, firewall, technical boundary, something that uh, when you expose your APIs. But then within your microservices application, how those microservices communicate uh, with each other, that, that's a, a different game. So, so basically, uh, the, there are new ways of, of uh, applying uh, the policies to the uh, connection between microservices. For example, a service mesh, which uh, I'm, I will be talking in the, in, in the later slide. So that, creates a network over the uh, microservices components and gives you the possibility to apply policies how that network actually works. And that happens inside the microservices application. API management is optional. You can kind of uh, treat your API management as a component within the application, but that's typically overkill and the use case is slightly different when on the inter-application it's kind of uh, advised to have the API management on top of that. Or there are other ways like event-driven microservices, which means that you will have a 
a event management system like Kafka and the microservices are meeting uh, events and then other microservices who are interested on those events will then take those and do the things uh, that need to do for, for them, for example, store that information on their local storage and so on. We don't have time to talk about that today, but, but uh, let's talk about the service mesh since there seems to be a, some kind of a confusion. What is an API management, what's that role, and what's the service mesh, and what's that uh, uh, meant for? So I will be talking about the Istio. Istio is the uh, platform for, for uh, interactions between microservices. Uh, IBM is, is uh, one of the founding members of, of Istio. We are committed to that. Uh, we, are, we are developing that. But the uh, Istio or service mesh is not an API management solu solution. It's not an integration solution. It handles the network traffic within the microservices application. So that's what it's, it's uh, meant for. There are, if we look at the Istio's features, there are security, policy enforcement, traffic control, there are rate limiting, load balancing, uh, routing, things like that. Sounds like an API management solution, but it's not. That the use cases are totally different. Since the API management is around providing productized APIs to consumer organizations. There are need for managing the organizations, development organizations, consumer organizations, and uh, that should not be included in the application itself. So then what does a, a service mesh or Istio actually do? Uh, it, it intercepts the, the uh, network traffic within your microservices uh, application through a component called uh, a sidecar proxy, which means that the microservices don't actually know that they are in the service mesh. So the, there are a component called Envoy that actually takes the traffic and knows where the microservices are, and then there's the control plane that can manage where and how this, this traffic should be uh, routed to. So basically, that allows you to do a, a uh, policy-based routing of the network traffic within your uh, microservices application. Uh, and then you can do A-B deployments, scannery testing, things like that within the application. So basically, for example, a, a use case, so how we do A-B testing of the microservice here. So uh, we want to do no coding kind of a, a approach, policy-based. That's the kind of operations tool. It's not the development tool, it's the operations tool. So now we have two versions and we want to have some of the traffic to the new beta version of that application and then have the majority of the uh, traffic to the uh, stable version and then we can compare how they are actually working. So basically we can apply a policy to the control plane of the Istio and the Istio does the traffic change so that, for example, 90% of the traffic will go to a stable version and then 10% goes to this version. So that's all inside a microservices environment. So now combining these uh, worlds together, so, so when we are taking the kind of a API management in here, so API management sits on, in front of your application. What it does, it has the, the uh, policies, uh, security policies, uh, mapping, uh, transformation, changes, for example, SOAP to REST, REST to SOAP, whatever needed. Uh, you can pass something, you can reduct data and so on, and uh, now you can have your custom policy. So that manages, that's a typical API management system. And then you have the virtual service, uh, the booking info virtual service there, and then uh, the policies are, are uh, injected into a service mesh that then takes care of the traffic in here. So uh, let's see how these then fit together. What, are, what if we want to utilize the data of the customers of the APIs in, the, in the, uh, our microservices architecture? So let's not use the percentage of the 
traffic management, but let's use that we want these customers, we want beta customers to use the beta version, and then we want the premium customers to use the stable version. Uh, we can actually inject that data, because we have that in the API management, we know who is actually using, who is calling that. So we inject that data into an Istio, and then we deploy a, a, a policy that takes that uh, information from the subscribing application and routes the traffic uh, to the environment. So now a two minute really, really quick demo on this. So basically we have in the uh, API and Connect API manager two plans, default plan, premium plan. Uh, and then we have uh, two applications uh, registered and they are subscribed one to the premium plan, one to the uh, default plan. So uh, beta customer application use the default plan, uh, premium customer is, is using a, a premium plan. Now what we want to do is, is that, let's say that traffic is now spread evenly on the, on the Istio service mesh since there's no policy yet uh, enforced there. We have uh, a, a policy in the file in the Istio, which says that the, okay, these premium plan customers go to a stable version, otherwise go, goes in, into the uh, beta version. And then we say to the Istio that, okay, let's apply this, this uh, uh, policy into the service mesh. So nothing uh, happens in the API management, uh, except we, of course, push the information who is doing that. Nothing happens on the microservices. What happens in the network within the micro application, uh, microservice application uh, service mesh. So now we have actually two uh, applications calling those. So you can see that there was a, a one was going to the stable version and the, the other one will now go to the uh, 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 default or what, what was the beta version of the application. So, and then from the, now you can see that the, the uh, traffic is flown differently and then in here you can see that the, the, all the different calls are going to the uh, beta version, other calls are going to the stable version, so it's not fluctuating anymore. And plus on top of that we have capabilities of actually having the, the uh, analytics on, on what's happening here. So basically, uh, that was the really, really short demo of the uh, information, but I, I hope that gives you the idea that where the API management sits on top of the microservices and why the microservices management, the service mesh is not replacing API management, they coexist, so, so this is something that in the future, you should bear in mind. We have one minute, so any questions? questions. Uh, and if not, I will be uh, at the IBM booth doing the, you know, the uh, reaction game. <laughs> that, was, that was a reaction game, yeah. 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 If not, so thank you very much. <laughs>